Welcome to Lab Results. We are live. So glad to have you all this evening. And uh, we have a great guest tonight uh, with a great topic from Monday, which we had a great live Black Man Lab uh, meeting on Monday night that was just super powerful and, and super insightful for our young folks as well as our old folks as well. So we had a great one. And we should have a great conversation this evening as well. With me tonight is my brother, Joe Barker. Joe. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing this evening, brother? Good to see y'all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and before we get started, before I introduce our guests, uh, I just want to talk about where we started. Black Man Lab started roughly about five years ago or so by four fathers um, that got together to give their sons a different voice. Because uh, we know as fathers, quite often, our sons will tune us out. Um, so we get an uncle, we get a godfather, a good friend, um, somebody to give them a different voice. And when we do that, um, sometimes they listen and, and take that that um, information in uh, and, and use it appropriately. Uh, that grew from just being those four fathers to when we were meeting originally before the pandemic, we were having over 250 black men in the room to talk about different subjects every week. So uh, we wound up going virtual while we were on uh on, on, I call it pandemic break. And um, we wanted to keep that here. So that's where lab results comes from. And we also wanted to have a deeper conversation with um, some of our guests, because quite often we have guests and we're not able to get into deep into their background. So that's what lab results is about. Um, before we get started with anything else, uh, Joe, did you want to bring on the ancestors? So yeah, so we're gonna do a, a kind of condensed version of it, all right? And so on Monday nights when we're in, in person, that safe and sacred space that, that you all may not be able, some of our followers may not be able to experience, we wanna kind of bring that same uh, energy here. So what we do is we just call out to, to our ancestors, our ancestors that you know navigated the middle passage, our ancestors that navigated the systemic issues that we've historically dealt with that put in us the, the energy, the, the tenacity to continue to struggle, to continue to fight. And our, our, our guest is gonna get into some of that himself because he is, he is continuing that fight himself. The ancestors are poured into him. So what we wanna do is we're just gonna take it very, very quickly. If each one of you all, and I'll do the same, just call out you know one of your ancestors, maybe a, 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 a one that's passed, one that you know meant something to you that you heard from back in the day, and they're like, yeah, I want to model myself after that person. You know, just call out their name on the count of three, and I'll do the same. One, two, three. Burl Barr. Pastor Williams. John Lewis. Martin Luther King. I say. I say. I say. All and, right. And and then we just want to go ahead just. Like Brother Studemite, let's make it with some of our little more recent ancestors, the ones that have recently energized us in this time, in what we are called to do now, the ones that have left in this century or in the in the just previous century um, that have meant so much to us in their fight and their struggle to put us where we are now. So if you all want to call out a couple names and uh, on the count of three, we'll do that and then we'll keep it moving. All right, one, two, three. Marcus Garvey, uh, Bishop Arthur Embrasure, Malcolm Bishop X, I say, I say, I say, brothers. All right, thank you so much, Joe. Um, without further ado, because we are up against the clock, and we're only here for one hour, and I want to get as much information from this brother as possible. He was super powerful on Monday. We were fortunate. He's one of my brothers from Chicago, and we were super fortunate to have him. In, he, in our space here in Atlanta at the Black Man Lab. And uh, he just dropped gym after gym for our young folks. And uh, I want him to go ahead and introduce himself. Brother Tyrone. Yes, sir. So it's Tyrone Studemeyer. I am the, the, the husband of Valerie Beth Studemeyer, the father of Kennedy Joy Studemeyer. I've been married for 25 years and I have a 19 year old, his second year in Hampton University. I am also serve as the global vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion for Hyatt Hotel Corporation. 100,000 employees across more than 70 countries with 20 major brands, a multi-million dollar business. My responsibility is to look to provide strategies and tactics and goals and partnerships to look at our workforce, the workplace, the marketplace, in order for us to outperform the competition, to gain the market share, to do good. We're a purpose-driven organization. Our purpose is to care for people to be their best. 
Diversity, equity, inclusion is a manifestation of our purpose. We lead with empathy and we lead with care. Empathy, care plus empathy equals action. Mm -hmm. It is all about what actions we're going to take to be equitable and to be fair for all people. That is great. And, and, and I want to start where you started at, Brother Tyrone. I want to start at where you started at because I know that you didn't get to where you are today as the um, top male of color within the Hyatt organization. I know that you didn't get there without a lot of steps in between. Um, I'm sure some, some uh, heartache and some trials and tribulations along the way. Yep. Uh, but first and foremost, where did you grow up at? So, so, so I actually, I grew up in a little town called Detroit, Michigan, 2737 Fair <laughs> Park. Uh, blocks of Motown, Hitville, USA, home of Aretha Franklin, uh, Gladys Knight, uh, Stevie Wonder. You guys, most of it, you know, you're, you're in the 70s, 80s, getting to know who that is. Some of the young folks might not know who they are, but these were pioneers in the music industry back in the day. Diana Ross and the Supremes, et cetera. Uh, many may know Barry Gordy, who founded it. Uh, both my parents moved from the South to the North for better life. They met, they married. <laughs> They had four children. I was one of four. I was number three. Um, my mother continued education, became a registered nurse. My father worked at, the, at Calac Motors, took early retirement, and started his own trucking business, hauling gravel and sand. So he moved from the inner city to the suburbs for a better life, a better job, better homes, better schools, better fill in the blank, right? My parents wanted to give their children the very best. Now, when I moved to this community, I thought I had did something wrong because I was roughly about third or fourth, going into third or fourth grade. And I went from an area where everybody looked like me, talked like me, we ate the same kind of foods and played the same, same type of games to a community where nobody looked like me, nobody talked by, like me. They ate the same kind of foods and we were not welcome in that, in that community. And all I saw was white people mm -hmm. that did not welcome us. I'm a product, this is in the 70s. So they drove their cars across the, our lawn. They threw eggs and I would, they trash our lawn and would say, niggas, go back to where you came from. We were not mm -hmm. welcomed in that. So at a very early age, I had to learn how to navigate through cultural differences. But there was a glimmer of hope. There was a couple by the name of Wally and Laura. They were your, your, your typical leave it to beaver household. Wally was always cutting his grass and trimming his bushes and doing something in the garage. Laura wore the poodle skirt, the high heel shoes, the apron, the pearls and the cloth hair. She was always baking. There was always something in the windowsill. As I would ride my skateboard, I would smell those cookies. and like, oh my gosh, she's fabulous. She's wonderful, right? And with Wally, you know, he was always doing something in the garage. And I says, what's in that garage? What is that man doing? Because my orientation growing up in the suburban, it was all about Friday the 13th. A lot of murders took place in the suburbs, right? So he must have a dead body in that garage. And as a kid, <laughs> right, I wanted to explore what was happening, right? And one day they had trashed our lawns and Wally and Laura came over to help us clean up our yard. And you know, they rang the doorbell and I ran to the door as a kid and they had these chocolate chip cookies and this apple pie. We want to welcome you and apologize for how you've been treated in the community. And my parents says, don't eat that, those cookies and apple pie. They're now they're trying to poison us. <laughs> right? I was like, oh my God. So as a child, this is just crazy, right? The odds. And September rolled around and my mother worked midnights, my father worked days. And Wally and Laura said, because they had befriended our family, was very nice. And we would visit back and forth and they were, you know, eventually got a chance to eat those cookies. <laughs> so Wally said, listen, you guys, your, my father left at 5 a.m. My mother got home at 7. He says, I'll take Tyrone to school. We'll take Tyrone and drop him off and pick him up. You guys get your rest. This is how close we came over the summer. So we go to school. Wally walks me in. Laura walks me into my class. I sit down in the front of the row. They pat me on the head, give me a lunch with these chocolate chip cookies in it. And say, well, son, we'll be back to get you at 3.15. Had a great time. Everybody was wonderful. We get home. Uh, my mother and father says, how did, they didn't ask me what I learned. They didn't ask me who I met. They asked me, how did they treat you? Mm. I didn't understand. I said, they're pretty good. I'm going back tomorrow. Why Lord took me back to school the very next day, the same ritual. They did it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. My father shows up to pick me up. He comes to the school. He says, I'm here to pick up my son, Tyrone. He says, we ain't got no black kids here. Wow. What? He says, that's my son right there. He says, that couldn't be your son. They thought that I was this adopted boy from India mm. that Wally and Laura had adopted. Mm. Friday, I go back to class and everything changed. I went from sitting in the front of the room to the back of the room. I went to eat lunch with friends, eat lunch by myself. 
I went from being in the playground playing to being a spectacle in the playground. So I had to learn earlier in my life, earlier to how to navigate, to get ahead, to get involved. Now the story goes on. And let me just say, this is not a sad story for me. My story has not happy, happy ending. So this is not about pity and I'm not looking for, this is not a pity party. I'm not looking for somebody to feel sorry for me because I, I, I have a happy ending to this. So my father died when I was 13. My oldest brother was gunned down by another black man. And we lived in a pretty, pretty, pretty cool neighborhood, but yet he was shot by another black man. My father grieved himself to death, began to drink and had a, had a stroke and fell down some stairs and broke his neck. Mm. My mother died my second year in college. We were middle class. There was no grants. There was no, 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 no subsidies I could get. This was under the Reagan administration. They didn't believe that black folks should be educated, right? So we didn't have money that I was getting to pay for it. My sister was, was 16, was 15 with a two-year-old. I was not in so a certain set of, of a, a whole set of circumstances that was not done by my own. I became a father immediately to my sister and to her daughter. So I had to go to work, right? I had to go to work. So I go to work, I get a job and I'm the mail boy at Sprint at GET who had a long distance service. And I delivered mail and at night and I used to wait till everybody left because I didn't nobody know I was the mail boy. This is pre um, uh, internet and, and emails. We didn't have emails in, in the 80s. This right, wasn't right. the case as it was today. So the administrator, the, the admins would type up the ma- memos. I would proof them, put them in the mailbox and deliver them all day and all the mail that people got. There was an email that came, there was a, a memo that came out that said, we're going to open up an office in Chicago and we're selling our long distance service to Sprint. If you have a home, we will give you $25,000 to relocate if you're in an apartment, we'll give you 5,000 and you have to sign a two-year contract. I went to my manager says, does this apply to me? What they didn't know was that I had a home, no. <laughs> right? So I said, well, this is an easy $25,000, right? I, I, right? So I get the job, I move, I go into customer service. Now I'm in Chicago. All the things I heard about Chicago was, was the, the, the Valentine massacre, the, 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 the shooting, the gangs. So I lived in Schaumburg. Oh, wow. The white community, as you know, what Schoenberg was. Yeah, yeah. Brent was in Rosemont by the airport. So I didn't come into the city because I was fearful because of what I've heard, right? I came early. I stayed late. I worked overtime. It was uh, technology, long distance services, and Sprint was a big boom with the cell phones and all this technology was huge. So the company grew. So I knew early on that I did things that nobody else wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I did things that were broken, but that the only one way is to fix them. So I remember we were having conversations with, it was a big boom and we were disconnecting people's services for non-payment, but people were making their payments, but the payments were going to a, raw, to a different lockbox. So they asked people to, it was in our corporate headquarters is in Kansas City. They said, if, if anyone would volunteer to go and apply this cash so we can turn these phones back on. So I decided, I raised my hand and says, I do nothing about cash application. I do nothing about accounts receivable. I do nothing about accounts payables, but I went, learned, and then after going through that assignment and applying all that cash and doing accounts receivable with accounts payable, I then was promoted to be a manager in, in credit and collections. Mm. Began to collect on bills and do that. Then I was moved from manager to director, for dec- director to cluster manager through my career. And then I decided I was enough courage to move to the city downtown Chicago. I then got a job at Montgomery Ward's corporate office in loss prevention, doing collections on bad checks and stop payment checks. Same drill. Came early, stayed late, worked all the overtime, drew my numbers, was blowing out the water, went right into management. Montgomery Ward sells their, their, their um, uh, loss prevention check collections to a group of brothers called the Riccobini Brothers in a very white predominant community. I worked with them for a couple of years and then went to work for Wilson Sporting Goods in the National Golf, Div- Golf Division as a, as a, as a global um, director of credit and collections. Okay. Is that the same Riccobini brothers? The that same Riccobini. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. So working for and that so that took me to Wilson Sporting Goods, working in, in, in golf. And and there were very few black people playing golf. Right. And the only black people on the golf course were the caddies. Yep. And my grandfather was a caddy for many years at the golf course in, in, in Michigan. 
So I was familiar with golf and, you know, played a little bit, but was never welcome to the golf course. But now I'm in the driving seat where credit collections, where I'm providing a line of credit for golf pros and professionals to get golf clubs. So now I'm their best friend. Because if you can't pay your bills, I can't release new merchandise, put you on a payment plan and we get new merchandise. So we became a whole different world was opened up to me. We leave with white men playing golf, working at uh, resorts and working with golf pros and professionals was a totally different world for me. Then we were acquired by another company to decide to redesign it. I then leave and I took a sabbatical and began to work at my church with Dr. Bra uh, Arthur Embrasure. And I worked with Valerie Norman Gammon who created, we created a TV show because I had a music background where I sang with Aretha, with Nita Baker, with did some stuff with, um, um, some stuff with um, uh, Circle of Life with Elton John, so did some recording in the studio. So I always had more than one revenue stream. So okay. was, hey, hey, let, me, let, let me stop you there, Ty, because you blew me away Monday when you when you mentioned that. And then when one of the young fellas said, blow something, and you just instantly did it, I was like, oh, he wasn't kidding. <laughs> nah, not kidding. And I'll tell you a funny story. People would say, you know, well, you never sang for Aretha, but then when they when she when she died and they saw me at the funeral yeah. in the third row, it changed yeah. everybody's perspective. Well, he must yeah, have yeah. he must have known her, right? But you don't grow up in Michigan and not know how to sing. You don't grow in Detroit and not have something right. right there, right? But again, I've always had multiple multiple revenue streams. Sure. Right. I never wanted to find just one thing that I depended on <laughs> because again, as black men, you know, we were we were easily dispensable. Right. The last in, the first to go, you know, people didn't know how to work with black people, particularly black men. So I've always had multiple things that I did. So I was doing jingles on the radio. I was, you know, I worked with a guy that had a uh, street cleaning services at night, cleaning gum off of the streets. You know, I've always had something that I've worked hard. So I just didn't. So again, I keep my, my history. So then I leave Hewitt. Uh, I leave uh, Wilson Sporting Goods and I work at the church volunteering because I had a little change so I could afford to kind of figure out what I wanted to do next because I had a severance package and I got, and what people don't understand severance is, you know, I got three weeks per what, per year. I had been there for 10 years, mm. right? So I could afford to figure, take some time to figure out what was next for me. So I began to work at the church and we build a, you know, build a whole um, infrastructure around concerts and musicals. And we brought in the Winans, Gladys Knight, um, um, uh, Jennifer Holiday. We created environments that most black churches couldn't create and provided concerts and events so people couldn't afford to go. And these concerts were free. And the church grew from 5,000 to 25,000 with a five year time period because of the type of work we were doing in the community mm. and the work that we were doing. So I think it's God's first, family second, community third. So you mm. got to be in a situation where you're giving back to much is given, much is required. And once you get back, that's we've been placed on this earth to do good and do stuff for others. So I give more than I receive because that's what I was called to do. Hmm. Right. So I have no doubt about it. But church, <laughs> your love for Christ is first, your family is second, and community is third. And I think that formula has worked out for me and has, has helped me tremendously. So now I'm trying to, I need to go back to work thinking about it. My money's getting a little low. I got to make sure I got money. And I, a brother that went to church with me, his name was Howard Henry, was an usher. And he worked for Hewitt Associates. And he says, well, we're doing some hiring, you know, but you don't need no job. You're wealthy. I said, no, I need, I need, I need to make some money. Now. <laughs> right. You know, I don't want to be left out in the cold. He then sends my resume. I go out for an interview. And Hewitt was, was based in Lincoln, Charlotte, Illinois, which is about 63 miles outside of Chicago. So I, <laughs> Go out, I interview. I had five interviews with five different people before I got the job. Oh, wow. And what they couldn't believe was, and, and, and here, you know, job, you can't ask people's race and ethnicities, right? They couldn't ask and they couldn't determine what it was because the longer my hair, the straighter it gets, the hotter the sun, the redder my skin gets. So I really do look like I'm from India, from the Middle East. Hmm. And they couldn't understand that how someone could have much, that much experience and not have a degree. That was the other difficult. Well, how could he have done? He couldn't have possibly done these. And and I and I learned earlier. I got reference letters. I've got you know my resume was tight, right? There was I had people that wrote and, and would call on my behalf because I knew I needed to build that because people were going to take me at my word because I didn't have a degree that they really wanted to take me at my word. I really had to prove that I could do these things. And every job I had, I exceeded the expectations and I asked for feedback. I asked for it in emails. I asked for it in writing so that I could make it a part of my portfolio as I was trying to work and people took the phone calls to verify. Okay. So I get to this HR consulting firm, 
I get the job and I found out later that the reason why it was so much difficulty because they didn't know what my race was. <laughs> and they were expanding in India and they wanted to say, if they were expanding in India, uh, would, would, would he go? Right. right. And I did. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And I did and did very well. So I can do everything nobody wanted to do. So I'm working now. I'm probably one of five managers that they brought in outside, outside of managers from the outside, which traditionally had homegrown their people. They too went from 5,000 to 25,000 people within a five year time period because of outsourcing. The company would outsource their benefits, their record keeping, administration to, to Hewitt, and we did the work. So again, I worked on something nobody worked on. I took, opened up call centers in Russia and in, in, in India, opened up call centers in London, opened up call centers in Texas. When they said we need some volunteers, I raised my hand because mm -hmm. what comes with that is that they pay you, they pay your hourly rate over time and they're paying for a stipend and you're getting a bonus. So I was, I was money driven. So I wanted to figure out how did I could build back up my wealth that I had spent with being off of that year, wanted to be able to rebuild my, so I was doing things of that nature, did very well in the job. And we were just starting to diversify. And there was a woman by the name of Juanita Robinson Brown came to me and said, my brother, my brother, you're one of the highest ranking blacks in the organization. People need to see, touch, and feel you. You need to get back to your community. Now I was like, look, I don't have time. I've got to work. People got to figure it out on their own. She said, no, brother, you were wrong. You got to help. I said, well, they, they go away. I got work to do. She kept coming and kept coming. And finally, I gave in to be the speaker for the Black History Program. Okay. I came into the room. She came and got me, went downstairs in the basement, down this corridor, and the light was out. And I said, where's she leading me to? Get into the room. There was fried chicken, orange pop, and watermelon. And they were doing some liturgical dances. And it was just very stereotypical to me. So when I spoke and I said, if we really want people to understand our culture, we have to give them a true cultural experience and to understand why we're eating fried chicken. Why are we eating watermelon? Why are these things important to us? And so we put on a program and put on that program, but have a musical background, we did a solicitation for people to join the Hewitt course. 90% of the people who are part of the course was white. The black people said, we cannot have an all black history program with an all white choir. And my response was, sure you can because if white folks are gonna learn how to sing gospel, spirituals, hymns, and anthems, and sing them in front of their peers, they are right with me. Mm -hmm. We put in this great program, we invited Ruby Bridges, who was the first African-American to integrate schools in New Orleans, was our keynote speaker. She's a full grown woman now, you may see the Rockwell painting of the federal mm -hmm. marshal as she escorted her to school, there's a Disney moving. She got no money from that, by the way, right? But that was a part of our history and she was, ca was captured that in the history. <laughs> She was a speaker, the choir sings, the CEO gets up and said, whoever put this program on needs to be a part of my executive committee. I was like, is that how you get to any to C-suite? <laughs> we, we talked, he said, I got this thing called diversity and I need your help. Now, I told him no, because what I didn't, I said, Listen, I'm the only back person sitting in this, in this seat. There's no one above me. I don't want to be the poster child for diversity and I don't want to be a part of Bill a Better Negro program. I did not want that. I wanted to come to work, do my job, do it well, get paid and go home. But God had a different plan for me. Right. He says, I'm gonna reserve the right to come back and have a conversation with you, but, I, but and, and the next time you can't tell me no. Yeah. Well, I went on and did my due diligence and connected my networks and my mentors and my sponsors. My, uh, one of my mentors is John Rogers of Airway Investment, Melanie Hobson, one of my mentors, Bishop Brazier, one of my mentors, Jim Laurie, the list goes on. And it was a mixed bag, take the job, don't take the job, dead end, you could change the environment. So he came back and he says, okay, we need to do this. What are, you, what are your thoughts? I says, well, I got some requests. One, that you need to be the executive sponsor for this work. If you are behind this work, we can get it done. Two, we needed to have some type of resources to do the work. He says, what do you mean? I said, we need to be able to fund the work. There's a cost to the revolution. Somebody's got to pay for it. He says, what Say do that. you mean? I made the number up. I said, $2.7 million. I just made it up. I had no right, I just said, made it up. I was trying to balance an invoice to a client that I was working on and it was stuck in my head. He <laughs> says, you got it. He says, you got it, right? I says, okay, this is getting better. I said, third but not least is that my parents taught me never find myself in a non-revenue generating role. This job sat in HR, which is over here. And when most companies go bad, they start to, you know, at that time, they, when, they, when they would look and start looking at overhead, it's who's not making money. I didn't want to find myself in that situation. So I said, if we feel that we're the world's largest HR outsourcing consulting firm, we're having issues with diversity. Our clients are having the same issue. If we could turn this to a consulting practice, I'm in. Okay. We turned it to a consulting practice. 
We test it internally and then take it to the marketplace. Again, keep it in mind, I need a multiple way of making money, multiple revenue streams. And I need to build my brand and I need to be a thought leader in this space. So I use that opportunity to then start writing articles, start speaking on panels, start being in the community to share the wealth and begin to build a brand. And I'm one of the top five diversity practitioners in the country. Hmm. That's how I got my start and was doing the work. And then a little bit into it, I worked there for 19 years. I got a call from a brother. His name is Orlando Ashford. And he says, listen, um, Hugh is going to drop the ball with you because they don't know what to do with you. And when they drop the ball, I'm going to be there to pick it up. And he works with Marsh McFitton Company. And they did drop the ball when they were acquired by AI. And he gave me a call and we had a conversation. He says, I'm going to bring you in to work with me in uh, June. So hold on. He connected in June and says, there's some other things going on. Uh, I need you to hold off until October. And I did. I gave my notice and the company says, we can't afford for you to go. We want you to take the holiday off and think about it. Now, this is around Thanksgiving time, by the way, and come back the first of the year. And we're going to give you a bonus, but we can't afford to lose you. I had already taken a job wow. from, from Mercer. And already taken a sign in bonus. I just need to end that relationship. But they were paying me not to go. Right. And so I still went, did well, did the work for two years. And then I get a call from Orlando again and said, Hey, my brother, Hyatt wants you to come work for them. Okay. I ain't got no resume. I didn't apply for a job. But because of the work that I had did and the brand that I had built, they wanted me to come and help. And that's how I got to Hyatt. And so the moral of the story is that. I've had a tragic beginning. I've lost loved ones. I came from humble beginnings and made it and lost it and made it and lost it. I trialed, I err, I worked hard, I stopped, I start. But my story is, ha I'm a happy empty. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm again, married of, 19, of, of, of 25 years, 19 year old daughter. You know, I'm living very comfortably. You know, I, I, I'm able to travel a little bit and do some things for others. So that's my story. Brother Studemeyer, I I did not want to interrupt anything because that is why we're here, man. Because the young brothers that feed into what we do needed to hear that. There were so many themes in there that I was like, I gotta let him talk about this. But I just want to go back to one that sure. you know, I mentor, and, 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 and Marty's very familiar with me. I mentor a lot of young men on Saturday mornings that are having some challenging backgrounds and very similar to some things you had to navigate at that age, you know, they're teenage and early twenties and everybody's chasing the bag, right? Everybody wants the bag, everybody wants the bag, but nobody wants to work. When you look at crime, it's because they don't want, they want to come take what I got that I work for. Exactly. And we won't get into the systemic reasons that those are in place because of how we're impoverishing, because of what has been placed on us. What I would like for you to expound upon a little bit more is one of those critical things. You did things, and you said it several times, you did things that other people wouldn't. Man, you said so many things in there, Tyrone, like I did, I did the mail because nobody would do it. I did this because nobody wouldn't do it. Like, what, what is that? I, I, can't, I don't even know the question, but I know that the young brothers need to hear what drove you to just keep doing that, what you want to do. Was it only money? Was it, was it um, a, 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 a better outcome that you were expecting or looking for? What is it that drove you to do things that nobody wanted to do? And what would you say to those brothers listening that need to hear that? You know, my driver was I didn't have a degree and I knew that it was required to be a leader. But I had leadership skills that was embedded in me from the beginning of time with my parents. My parents always told me, you can do and be whatever you want to be, regardless of education, race, gender, or whatever you can do and, 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 and get it done. Just be the best at it. My father said, son, this, when things are down, there's only one way and it's up. So I lived and, and, and you know, the conversation, your word is your bond. Right. 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 So if you say you're going to do something, you got to do it and do it to the fullest. So it was so delivering. I was the best mail boy that they could ever have. Mm. The mail was on time. It was accurate. Right. I didn't take it lightly. Now, I didn't do it till everybody left because I was embarrassed. Okay. I was, and, and by the way, it was the sharpest male boy in the building because people never knew what I did. Because I would come to work and it's like, what do you work on? 
I can what, 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 that, brother. What, what, what flow does he work on, right? They didn't know. <laughs> I was just a male for it. So I was always in a possession that you want to you wanna dress, behave, and show up for the job you want to be in. Okay. Yeah. I've heard that before. So that's, I've always wanted to be accepted. Great. So I carried myself in that regard. And mm -hmm. people thought it, people thought that I was an executive, but I was the mailboy. And wow. here's the deal. By being the mailboy, I knew everybody's business. I was gonna say I read, yeah. <laughs> I read it. So I knew what was going on. You know what? That stock price was really interesting the other day that went up. We lost about three bitcoins. Well, what do you how do you, you know? So you start conversations, right? I said earlier that you know, when I worked for Hewitt. I was trying to get ahead and wanted to connect in. I knew that if I could get in front of the right people, I could talk enough to be able to influence and impress them. So I would, I would monitor when the CEO came to work and when he went home. Yeah. And I said, to face myself in situations where I could meet him to have a conversation. And oftentimes what people don't do is that the most excluded person in an organization is its leaders. Nobody wants to tell him he has no clothes on. Nobody wants to bring bad news. Nobody would ask him, how are you doing? How was your day? That's and when I would interact with him, I would say, Tim, how was your day today? What, what was challenging about your day today? Have, and he would say something, I said, well, have you read this article or do you know this? I, 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 you know, I'm, an, I'm a reader I'm, and I'm, I'm a sharer and I can retain data. I don't know where I got that from, but data is my thing. I can share. Did you know that 70% of people don't like doing these things? Did you know 90%? And that intrigues people so you get into a conversation. And I remember him telling me, he says, listen, son, he said, um, I can go into a room and I can see A, B, or C players. You're an A player. Don't let anybody tell you anything wise. That's what's up. Exactly. So you got to, what is your competitive advantage? What, how, do you, how do you stick out and show? Right? So I do things to my parents. I hold the door for women when they're coming, coming, coming in. And some women will fight you, right? Now, I'm just holding the door for me, equal opportunities, right? Yeah, right? You know, right? When I come into and I see paper on the floor, I pick it up. People watch those things. You know, yeah. it, it, it's funny that you say that. I used to work at, at, at a company. Um, I was probably, I worked for an African-American manufacturing company, and the owner was African-American. And outside of he and his family, his family owned, I was the highest ranking person. And we would walk the floor one day, right? And we were just walking the floor. And we didn't do anything. And so, you know, he's watching everybody in manufacturing do all these different things, but we didn't do anything. I'm just walking with him. And so we get done and we go inside. And I said, Mark, man, what, what were you doing? Like, I don't understand. Like, what, what, what was that walk about? I wanted to walk around and see if anybody was picking up some of this trash that's on the floor. Yep. Like, yep. If anybody took pride in where they were and would actually pick up a piece of trash that was on the floor. And as I'm walking around, yeah, everybody straightens up because they see me. But nobody was was tidying up, was cleaning up. And so the same things I saw on the floor this morning, I walked out there and I just said, hey, it's crazy how they look at little stuff like that, man. Oh, yeah, they look at that. Yeah, picking up paper, holding the door, pick, pushing chairs up. You know, I every company I worked for, it was as if it was my own business and what I wanted to look like and how I wanted to respect it. Yeah. Right. And people say, that's not your job. I says, it's all our jobs. Absolutely. Yeah. I live and work here. I'm, I'm, I'm here, more, here more here than I am at home. Yep, most right. of us are. Right. You know, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I'm in the hotel industry now, and so you know, when I go into a hotel, they're looking for, and that's where I rank. People are catering to me. I cater to them. Yeah. I come in the back door with the other workers. I respect that. Right. Yeah. So we have to remember who we are. We can't be so high and mighty, and we're coaches just engaged from our own culture. But I speak to everybody. My wife said you will talk to a park bench. <laughs> How you doing? What's going on? Now here's the downfall. I can't remember nobody's names. <laughs> I remember face, but you ask me their names. I don't know. I immediately yeah. say, someone say, well, we're meeting with so-and-so and so they say they know you. I says, I don't remember George. I say, hey, George, how's your wife? How's your kid? You know, you again, that's a disaffect, but I just, I just, I, I don't know any strangers yeah. and I'm too stupid wow. enough to say no. Hey, right. Hey, so no, I will no. do what I can. Yes. No, I can, I can, uh, I can vouch for him on that. We're, we're over at the uh, Hyatt Regency and everybody in there he knew them and they knew and he and they knew him. So uh they were they were constantly, you know, I, I came to the door and I said, I'm here for uh, Mrs. Stodemeyer. They're like, oh, let me get him. <laughs> you know, they know exactly who he was. You know, yeah, so. you know, I learned earlier that your everyday common people are the most impactful folks that you will meet in your life. Absolutely. I remember when I was working for Mercer and the driver was taking me to the airport, he says, uh, hey Mr. Studemeyer, I just want to let you know. 
your interview went extremely well and they highly, they, they highly respect, they, they highly hold you in high regard and respect. Mm. I just want to say thank you. This is a brother, mm. right? And an admin, I would go ahead and say, listen, I said, hey, I, so I learned earlier, my, my, my Bishop Brazier with my mentor says, always be kind to the secretaries. Oh, yeah. Always remember their birthdays. Always remember special days because they will make or break you and they will help you get things done. Yep. So with all the executives, admins, I've always been friends with them. Yeah. Candy, lunch, Secretary's Day, I'd never forget, really, right? Really, really. And in winning them over, I would find out, I says, hey, what's going on with the CEO today? Is he good move, bad move, right? Not a good move, not a big day. She said, you know, or to say, hey, how much time does he got today? I need 10 minutes. You got it. Come up and see him between two and two thirty, right? So you, you know, you want to be, you gotta. It, it, I don't like playing games in people's lives. So people say, do you play checkers or chess? And this is chess move. Chess. I don't, I don't like that, right? But I do think you need to be strategic with how you communicate and how you network. People think technology is our number one asset. It's people that's our one number one access. Amen. Amen. Say, say that. Amen. And it's I, and I that, appreciate your humility about it because some of the, some of the same things you're saying. I want these younger brothers that are listening, and and, and, and us, us old folks as well. Humility, the humility of it all. You, you, it sounds like you're one of those brothers that treats the janitor the same way you treat the CEO because we all deserve the same human dignity. And I think, brother, that is uh, at your core. I don't think you can learn to be a person like that. I think that's who you are. And I, but I do think you have to mirror that behavior because mm -hmm. of my, what my parents did. My parents knew no strangers. Sure. When we moved to the suburbs, uh, people that lived in our neighborhood, they would bring them over. They would expose them to things. And I was like, can't they just go home as kids? We need, this is for us. We're eating up all our food, right? But they were givers. So that was a part of who, a part of my orientation. So when you talk about being in the service industry and being with people, I actually treat the to and adore men better. Right. Right. Because at the end of the day, you know what? If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't exist. Right. Right. So right. the Bible says, honor and love and respect your elders. Right. And so I want to make sure we pay it for. And that's what I liked about, you know, the, the Black Man Lab uh, uh, meeting the other day and honoring, yeah. you know, open up this conversation, honoring the ancestors. We have to continue to do that. That gives us strength. It gives us power. You know, I've had the luxury and the privilege to be around John Lewis and C.T. Vivian. C.T. Vivian, when I was at Hewlett Associates, was one of my speakers. Oh, wow. He came to Chicago yeah. and yeah. had a conversation about race. And just in, in 2019 and, and how I and, and how I met Maui. We um, we in Chicago. And we I'm at, over our Global Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Council. Our CEO is the chair. I'm the co-chair. We had a meeting at the Civil Rights Human Rights Museum. We were honoring John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, Andrew Young, Zanola Clayton, um, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and they were all speakers. But C.T. Vivian and just and, and John Lewis took ill. Right. And I didn't know Maui, but um, I knew him. But I, I didn't remember that I knew him because I, they were in Chicago. My assistant made connections with us. I says, hey, I need an attorney, somebody who knows this and stuff, the city in for John Lewis. He was like, oh yeah, I got it, I got you. He blew the, 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 the roof off of the building about what, working in the community, what's doing with, 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 with the black male uh, lab and the things he was doing, but that's relationships. Yeah. Right, and you have people that would say, I need $25,000 to speak. I need 10, you know, he was like, I don't need nothing, just feed right. me. Right, exactly. And so you pay it forward. So those relationships are key. And our CEO was like, that brother's got to go and I need to spend time with him. He captivated the audience with what was happening in the black community and with solutions to be put in place. So I've had the ability and the luxury to do that and build relationships. And I, I value those relationships being here today. You know, listen, I have been talking since 5.30 a.m. today. I'm in a global role. So my days begin very early with China, which is a day ahead of us. We're already behind China. So I'm playing catch up when I'm talking to them. You know, I, I, did a, I did a session for Operation Push Today for their, their conference that's going on, where I interviewed three executives in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I had a meeting with, with, a, with a large consulting firm today with their white leaders, right, helping them to understand empathy and care and what it means and where the deficit is. You know, so you, you know, and, my, and, my, and, and you know, I couldn't do anything without the support of my family. And my family gets it, they understand it, but I have to make sure that when I'm with them, I'm present. Yes. So there's no phone calls, there's no emails. You have my undivided attention. Now I may fall asleep in the middle of the conversation, but I'm there. <laughs> but you were there. You but were I was there. I was you can't present. say I didn't show up. I was present, right? I was right. in. Right. So I think you know our brothers today have to have to know uh, who they are, but whose they are. Mm. We all belong 
to a higher higher calling, which is, in my opinion, Christ Jesus. You know, right. and we have right. to be doing that, and we have to live appropriate for our elders. We owe it to our elders to be successful, to reach out and to touch and feel. So, you know, my experience this past weekend in Atlanta with you guys were nothing short of amazing. It was humbling. It was it was eye opening, right? But it actually gave me a charge to do more. Mm. That, that, that was going to be what happens to people when you get involved. You end up just doing more. Yeah, and that was that was going to be my my next um, question to you, which is a pretty basic question, but just. What were your thoughts as you sat there Monday in the lab? What did you, what did you think? I, I had several different emotions that were going on, right? Mm -hmm. One, how did we get here? Where did we go wrong, mm -hmm. right? But then there was also that, you know, great, I was grateful, the gratitude was going on. The, the calling of the elders were amazing. The who needs a hug and all those men went up needed a hug and men don't hug. We're not affection, be, we're not affection, but to be able to be vulnerable enough to show that I need some male bonding. And I'm, sure. Arthur Embrasier, who was one of my mentors told me, he said, son, never lose your male bonding. Stay close yeah. to the brothers, right? So that was it going on. And then hearing the stories of the panelists and where they came from and what they yeah. did was, yeah. was yeah. remarkable there. It's just, we're resilient culture and we don't know it. Right. And I don't think our youth understand just how resilient they are. And we have to double down and push harder than we've ever had to before. I think one of the comments was one of the elders have said over time is, you know, how do you write this? Just get it done. Right. Mm -hmm. And you guys are getting it done. You're reaching people. You're feeding them because they're hungry. You know, yeah. you're nurturing them because they need love. You're guiding them because they need to be led. Yeah. Right. You're supporting them because they need that support. So um, I was I, I've been talking about it. I didn't even sleep. Uh, Sunday night when after, after coming off the Saturday's event sure. and all on the plane, I'm talking to a lady next to me on the plane about my experience in the land. And she's like, how do I get involved? This is amazing. There we go. So, um, Bishop Brazier also taught me, says, you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's true. Mm. 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 Give it and to that, a busy that, person. They'll that's get it this done. work. That is this work for sure. You know, and, and as we're talking, you know, looking at other partners, I was telling Monty that, you know, I, I, um, had a conversation with a very, a very large partner of ours that's what we're doing. They want in, right? And so one thing happened to another. One of the brothers that was on the panel has fuel trucks. I was in a conversation with some folks that saying, we don't know, Blacks don't sell fuel. They don't deliver fuel. Now I got somebody that I can put in connection with them, right? So yeah. that's what's important. How do we connect the dots? Yeah. And, and, and that, we, can, we, can, we create that biosphere and you'll start seeing a, a significant change in our communities right because number one you're you're like you were talking about with um our guy was on the panel that, that sells the fuel or that moves the fuel you know yeah you're helping him to make a connection but then also that's being seen by our young folks that they see that we have this power right that we can we can do for self we can create and yeah. um and really start to believe that and change their mindset, uh, which is what the Black Man Lab is all about. And that's, uh, I I'm glad that you got that experience and I'm glad that you you felt all that. The reason I asked that question was because it's so hard to quantify that room, right? And, you, and I'm sure even as you were probably telling people about it, um, you, you probably felt like you weren't doing it justice, right? Because that's- I wasn't. Yeah, it's so hard. I, and, and hey, we I'm part of it. I'm, Vice Chairman, I have a, I still have a hard time trying to explain, you know, the power of what that room holds, and and imagine when it's two hundred and fifty black men in the room, right? It's it's amazing. It's amazing. And, it's, and, and so you look at those are the unintended consequences, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know who I was going to meet, you know, and 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 the reality is that we ended at eight thirty, right? We took a photo, we put the chairs, so we went outside. We, we were outside talking until it rained. And, and, yeah. and we, that's yeah. because it rained, yeah. right? We would have yeah. still been there having, because the questions and the, the need was so strong. I would have stood out there in the rain because yeah. at the end of the day, when they're being that vulnerable and asking questions, mm -hmm. it's because they care, yep. because they want to do different. They want to do good. You know, I, and I think we have to stay close to them and show them how to navigate. I was telling them stories about the fact when you go into corporate America, be careful of what you say and how you address women. Because the Emmett Till thing is live and well today as it was when, you know, 60 years ago, right? It still exists. We can't, we can't be, you know, our authentic selves in, 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 in some cases. So lessons learned and stories told 
I think is important, but even more important to listen to hear what they what they're concerned with. Absolutely, and and that's a great point, man. When because I, I uh, I've learned in my career that what I can say or what others can say and get away with, I can't. You know, even if my intention is nothing, you know, there's no ill ill will in what I say. I just have to be very calculated in how I present things um, because because of this, you know, because I'm a black man, it's the reality of it. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I'm so glad that you got to be in that space. Um, and and let's talk a little bit because we're running up against the clock here. But let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you had you had that program that you talked about, the Rise High program that you know, a lot of antennas went up when you talked about it. Um, yep. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that here and, um, you know, kind of how we may look to partner in the future um, with it as well. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. It is called Rise High, R-I-S-E, Rise High and H-Y. Um, it is our Hewitt, Hyatt signature program. It is really the passion of our CEO and our CHRO who are both passionate about youth. It started really years ago for us where we wanted to know that there was uh, youth were unemployed globally and the number was over 100,000. It was a huge, huge number. We committed to hiring uh, 10,000 and it began to grow, right? We know now after the pandemic, 4.7 million youth between the ages of 16 to 24 are unemployed. That is our workforce of tomorrow. And the program for us is designed to really go after individuals who are 16 to 24 who didn't graduate high school and perhaps didn't go on to college and, and are currently unemployed. It's out on our website. You can look it up, you can apply. It is a global program for us. And we bring you in, we evaluate you by doing this kind of um, you know, interactive computer space to figure out where you are, to figure out what we need to help develop you. And it's really about individuals who really care and wanna serve. Serving people is hard work. Right, people are coming from all walks of lives and different attitudes, different positions. So it is not easy work. It is very hard work, but the reward is very is, is, is very good. You know, we meet you where you are, put you in different roles. For example, in our resorts, we can go from a pool boy to a waiter, from a waiter to a bar, etc. You're building skills. You're getting a certificate. You, I don't care if you leave and go to Marriott or Hilton, but you have some skill set that you can take on that's transferable. Is what we're trying to do to get kids, kids off the street into work. When we talk about some of our wait staff, and again, you have to work up to this. It's not happening the third day that you're on the job. You're not going to make $80,000. But over time, as you build, we have wait staff that make 80 grand a year. We have coffee service that make $100,000 a year, but they would have put their time in and they would have worked to move up. You know, And oftentimes we have people that walk, this, I don't want to work that hard, so they quit. Mm. You know, I don't want to move to a different city, so they quit. Mm. So we have to be able to say, you know, get people to see it's a long-term game and not a short-term, you know, give, right? So this job is designed just for that group and we're putting time and effort into that to be able. So I know we have a few gentlemen that were young men that were interested. I want to make sure we handle this with kit gloves to get them in and have conversations. You know, they have to interview, they have to pass a drug test, you know, um, which I, you know, hopefully they, 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 they will. But those are kind of the, 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 the grassroots piece, right? They got to apply, go through interview, and then they placed into where the needs are within the hotel. Know that we have 5,000 available jobs today because of the pandemic. That's a lot of jobs. Man, man, that's, well, that's powerful. And, and what's the age range you're giving for, for the young 16, men? 16 to 24, just as you, you can't work without a workers admit if you're not, if you're not greater than 16, okay. right? So we can't, so we, they got to be legit to be able to, work and um so we look at 16 to, to 24 in that particular this particular program gotcha. and then many will graduate out website so i can um, post it to our brothers yeah hyatt hyatt careers if you look at hyatt careers and, and type in rise high r-i-s-e capital h-y and they can apply there but what i want to do is really something special for this group right so we will get together talk through and figure out how we funnel them in. I want to kind of handle this with kit clubs to make sure we get them okay. exposed appropriately, right? Because sometimes you go through a website um, and it could fall into a you know black hole. Sure. I just sure. don't want that to be the case for this group, right? For any group, shall I say, sure. but 
I think that I want to be able to prototype and say, you know, from the black male lab, we hired 55,000 people. I'm making the numbers up, but you know what I mean? I want to be able to track it, measure it and prototype it. So if we can nail this in Atlanta, we can scale it in other cities. Okay. Perfect. Well, we, we will work hard with you on that to make that happen. Cause I know that there were some young men that were definitely interested um, and, and have reached out to me since Monday. So Good, good. Um, I had a cup text message and some folks linked in with me and Facebook. I'm at my max of Facebook. So please tell them I'm not ignoring them. I can't accept them if they, I'm at my max. I can't, <laughs> can't let nobody else in, right? Um, yeah. But certainly, and I don't think it's going to be hard work because I think the hard work is you guys have done. You you have them. Yeah. You've identified them. You're working with them. Now we just need to help connect the dots for them. Yeah, and, it, and it, it's also good that there's some accountability that they have to the Black Man Lab now, you know? Yes, um, yes. And, and, and that would, that should work in the favor of you know the Hyatt if they if they were to come on and that we, they wouldn't want to fail the Hyatt but also they wouldn't want to fail the lab as well so right yep great stuff well look man we this has been awesome we end every week um, with one question that we ask our panelists uh, which is tell us about your habits rituals and disciplines that you do every day to help you to keep move in and help you to keep doing the work that you do? Um, great. So first and foremost, prayer and mm. pray without ceasing. So prayer is all day. I, mean, I pray when I get up in the morning, I pray for my family, I pray for unity. I'm grateful and thankful for waking up another day. Throughout the day, I'm praying that I say in the right thing, meet the right people, treat people with respect. I end my day with prayer uh, before I lay down. Um, I Part of my rituals is, you know, reading scriptures, I meditate, you know, I do my breathing exercises to center myself, uh, as you guys did. I was really, when I you like guys did the, reason, like the breathing guy. exercises that you guys did the Monday night, was like, okay, this is on. They, they're doing my <laughs> technique. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe center breathe yourself, out. right? You know, um, that's really great. Because what it creates is, you know, for me, a psychological safety, a safe place, right? And then I try to do good. You know, I try to make sure, again, a man of my word, if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I may be late, I may be slow, but I'm going to get it done. Um, I, I make it a point to reach out to people, uh, check in, how you doing, what's going on. I think it's important to just say, just thinking about you. You know, I have seen people to say, you know what? I got that card from you in the mail. I got that text message. I was about to commit suicide because mm -hmm. I didn't think that nobody loved me. Nobody cared, mm -hmm. you know, so I take that, I take that seriously. So, you know, I'm a big connector and I try to respond as, as quick and as fast as I can. Um, so I think, you know, uh, reach, it's, you know, I'm a giver, not a taker. So it, it, it energized me to be there this weekend. You know, I was exhausted. I needed to see something different. And I was energized after this, after my time in Atlanta with the, you know, Black Men Labs. And I saw two different ends of the spectrum. So again, giving is important to me. But prayer without ceasing, you know, you know uh, breathing techniques, you know, um, taking care of yourself is first. Yeah. Right. And I try to do things, you know, you know, this is not to be elitist or certainly something I fear, but I try to get a massage once a month. Mm. You know, I try to go to the health club a couple of times a week, you know, to do those things. I could do more. I try to eat better. Um, so the, all those things that we're taught, you got to do it now. People are young and invincible. They don't see it. But by the time they reach 50, it's going to pay. It, they're going to feel it different. <laughs> Hey, right. let, me tell, let me tell you <laughs> life's a little different at 50 than it was at 30 oh, right sure. it takes a little, little more effort to get out of the bed uh but i oh, think you know uh, and i think the kids are more focused i say kids i'm sorry these young adults are more health conscious than we were right they're exercising yeah. they're taking more so they're a little ahead of us and yeah. in, in, in in all due respect so the the well-being piece is is what i'm concerned about i don't mean well-being from exercise the mental state mental yeah Right. And the, you know, the mind and, and not letting people control their thinking and not letting people make them feel like they're not good enough. You know, so it's this whole mind over matter type thing. Uh, and to be positive and reinforcing, you got to reinforce each other, you know, and it shocks people. I said, people, you look really good today. You know, my sister, you, you know, you're gorgeous. People take it the wrong way, but people mm -hmm. need encouragement. Yeah. Affirmation, right. man. Affirmation. Affirmation. You know, I was on the airline last night. And I was telling the flight attendant, says, I really enjoy your voice. It's calm and it's soothing. Yeah. Um, I remember I was on, um, I took a Southwest Airline flight and the gentleman was an African-American brother, about six, five tall, beautiful voice. But he had to explain to us that there was a flight that came in 
that the passengers were going to leave that flight to come onto our flight because the flight was, the plane was damaged. But the calmness of his voice was so professional, so it was amazing. I actually, right then and there, went on their website. And, and, and did a combination letter with him and then, and then sought out the, the, the hotel. Who's, who's in charge here? I want you to know this brother, because mm. we complain all the time. We don't right. take time out to compliment one yeah. another. Right. And it, meant, it means a lot to people to be able to do that. So just stop and be patient with one another, give ourselves some grace, but be more affirming and confirming and reaffirming and support is that you know, you're doing a good job. I went around today to our tech people, which is all brothers, They're, we were moving floors and you know, changing computers and all this stuff. These brothers are working hard. I am grateful that you're doing this job. I am grateful that you're here. I come to my desk, this brother bought me lunch. Mm. Just because I said grateful. How grateful I was with the work he did. He saw fit to buy me lunch. I see you working hard. I come in, you're working. I leave, you're working. I'm buying you lunch today. I didn't ask for that. Right. So and, and that's, right? That's, what, that's what the laws of reciprocity are all about, right? Exactly. So, it is so funny. I had this conversation with my daughter long ago where I, I explained to her because she was talking about some different material things that she had wanted. And I explained to her, I said, all of that stuff will be out of your out of your purview in a relatively short period of time. But when you do for other people and it comes back to you, that stays with you for the rest of your life. You'll never forget it. Right. You never forget, you might forget about the purse that you bought. But you'll never forget about you did something good for somebody else and you changed their life. And that winds up coming back to you in some other kind of way. You know, I look at the story I tell about Wally and Laura. They, they, they poured into my life. Right. You know, they were white people that t- took me to school, picked mm-hmm. me up, you know, made me, you know, so, you know, you and I remember that as if it was yesterday. Right. Right. You know, right. so I think, you know, doing good, you know. Sunlight will always dark, will, 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 will brighten the dark places, right? So, you know, someone told me today, you know, I just love the energy you bring. You just elevate me when you walk into the room. That's my brand. Right. Right. But that, so, but, and that elevates you, though, right? It that does, makes, exactly. You know, that's, yeah. that's how that goes. So, listen, I can go on all night with you, brothers. I think I know. We, we, uh, we, have, we have made, our, made it to the end here uh, relatively quickly, it felt like, right, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, what we're going to do, Brother Tyrone, is we're going to end the same way that we do, even in the live sessions. We do it here um, on, on, on uh, Lab Results. So I'm going to ask you, brothers, you could lock your arms just like we're in person and then just repeat after me. I'm a link in this chain. I'm a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it, and it won't, won't break, break here. here. I'm a link in this chain. I'm a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it won't break here. We are links in this chain. We, we are linked in this chain. And we won't break here. And we won't break here. Ashe. Thank Ashe. you again, brother. Appreciate Tyrone, you thank so you much. so much, man. If um with Marty's permission, I want to follow up with you on a phone call if you don't mind terribly. Please, when please. Just just up. just text text me first so I can tell you if I can talk. Perfect. I'll tell you when I can talk. Marty's got the formula. Yeah. He'll tell you he got the Absolutely. formula down. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll be in touch soon. We, you, you're part of the family now, brother. So jump on in the pool with us. <laughs> I'm in. So much. All love right. you, man. Good job, love Mark. Appreciate you. Okay. Brother. Love y'all, man. Thank you. you. Take care. Thanks, Mark. I think Mark was controlling this for us. Thank yeah, you, Mark. Was. The, the master mixer back there.